Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session of Living Sickle Smart presented by Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota. We are so thrilled. I've been waiting all month for this particular uh, presentation on curative therapies for sickle cell disease. We are so glad all of you could join us. We are um, incredibly honored to have a special guest with us today, Dr. Ashish Gupta, whom you'll hear from in a moment. In the meanwhile, I wanna make sure to get all of the housekeeping out of the way. We all know, as I said, that this is the Living Sickle Smart, our uh, 2021 series. We want to thank, special thanks to our partners and sponsors, Be The Match, Bluebird Bio, and Novartis. We, um, if you are interested in watching previous versions or the replay of this um, at a future date, you can do so through our website, um, which is going to redirect you to our YouTube channel. Yes, we are trying to get more followers on our YouTube channel, so please visit us there. And then you can stay abreast of future um, webinars and other events through our Eventbrite channel. So if you go to YouTube, Eventbrite, um, all that you have to do is search for Sickle Cell MN or Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota. Uh, we also invite you to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those social, I shouldn't say all those social media uh, platforms because we can only handle so many, but um, our primary social media channels are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, and so we invite you to uh, follow us on any or all of them as well. We do wanna uh, take a moment to do a special shout out to um, Be The Match, which is perfect for this particular topic because um, they have created a sickle cell warrior package that we think that everyone should have. And it is absolutely free, but it is full of helpful resources for individuals living with sickle cell disease so whether you are that individual or if you are a provider who cares for individuals with sickle cell disease, please direct them to sicklecellconnect.com to get their resource package. As I said, um, the Living Sickle Smart has been a virtual education series in September. We focused on sickle cell disease, a public health emergency. October, we have been focusing on disease modifying treatments and curative therapies, where we had amazing interviews um, with providers like Dr. Ashish Gupta, like Dr. Uh, Stephen Nelson, as well as individuals representing Be The Match, the American Red Cross, um, as well. November, we will be talking about planning for your future and navigating life transitions, right? And then December, it's smiling through the pain, how pain can impact mental and emotional health. So we would love for you to join us at any or all of those events. And without further ado, I would like to um, introduce you to Dr. Ashish Gupta, who will be uh, our presenter today. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A um, button that's at, typically at the bottom of your Zoom um, window, and then we will address those questions at the end. If you put them in chat, we may not see them, so please use the Q&A button uh, instead. All right, so I'm going to turn the controls over to Dr. Gupta. You can take it away. Thank you, Ray, and it's totally my honor to be here and interacting with um, the families and the providers. So let me just pull up my PowerPoint slide here. Uh, you didn't want to see my emails for sure. Uh, so um, hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm Ashish Gupta, I'm, one, I'm an assistant professor at University of Minnesota in the Division of Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplant and Cellular Therapies. Um, and uh, I am actually um, heading the sickle cell program here, um, especially focused on the curative therapy options, which um, is, is, uh, is an area of big change, um, uh, great things coming down the pike and uh, definitely something um, which, should, which needs to be discussed more and more. And uh, um, every family needs to know what options are available there and where the, where the future of uh, 
transplant and cellular therapy as going in sickle cell disease. So the objectives for this presentation is, as you see, discuss, 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 that I think is the main thing, <laughs> discuss curative options for sickle cell disease. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss some of the barriers to access transplant options in the sickle cell community specifically. Uh, we'll also try to identify some of the solutions to provide access to curative therapies. Um, and uh, then I think throughout the presentation, what I will do is I'll describe my role and um, as a transplant physician and all these nuances and how I can help the families and what, um, what information I can provide the families. Uh, and again, feel free to put in the questions. Um, my, my whole agenda here is to discuss the issues from the, from the provider side, from the patient side, and see how we can resolve these together. So as you know, curative therapies in the sickle cell disease um, have been in, um, in limelight for a while now. And uh, we live in, an, in a very interesting era right now where um, we have transplant and gene therapy as, as an option. Uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to review the, the sickle cell disease um, quickly because we need to know what we are dealing with before we jump on to see how we, how we can cure it actually. So, I'm going to discuss about the etiology and impact of the disease, and uh, then I'm going to jump on to and uh, spend most of my time discussing about the curative therapies. So what is sickle cell disease? Um, as, we, as most of us know um, in this forum that sickle cell disease is an issue with your red blood cells where the red blood cells, which normally look like this, like around by concave disc, actually turn into a sickle-shaped red cells. And the, the main issue there is, uh, is the large protein inside these red cells, which is called hemoglobin, and which looks like this fancy uh, cartoon on the side here. What it contains is heme and globin. Globin is actually uh, composed of two chains of these alpha subunits and two of these beta subunits. And how it is formed is actually when, when, a, when a baby is formed, um, they get half of this genetic code from the mom and half from the dad, especially, especially specifically for, uh, for coding for this protein. So uh, if there is any defect in that code um, and actually then they need to have it both from mom and dad, that results in the sickle cell disease. And as, as we know, there are many, many types and many forms of it. What it ends up doing is in sickle cell disease is, is it actually, um, it reduces the flexibility of the, of the red blood cell. And with that, what I mean is um, when the red blood cells go through circulation, uh, and we'll see that in the next slide, uh, they actually need to bend and uh, they need to be flexible actually. If they do not have that property, then they can break actually, which is a very common thing that happens in, in sickle cell disease. So here is a cartoon depicting the same thing, actually. So this is a normal blood flow through a blood vessels. And these are your nice, cute looking red blood cells. Uh, when they go through this, these the smaller branches, they have to squeeze through them and they have to change their shape according to the, the blood vessel that they are going through. And the end goal of this, these blood cells is that to, is to deliver the, the, the oxygen, which is carried by the hemoglobin to the specific tissues. If you see here in, that, in this figure B, this in, in case of sickle cell disease, these blood cells are turned into more of a sickle shaped cells, which actually are not that pliant when they go through these smaller blood vessels. Um, I'm sorry about that. So, uh, so what ends up happening is that they can sometimes block actually or cause issues with the with a microcirculation resulting in, in blockage of these smaller vessels. Um, and eventually it will result in decreased oxygen delivery and, thus, and the target tissue where they're going actually can die as a result of that. I don't need to tell this uh, audience about all the issues that sickle cell disease can cause in all different organ systems. Essentially from head to toe, um, thinking about the brain, eyes, um, like hands and feet, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, um, everything, and spleen, of course, like everything can get, get affected in sickle cell disease. Um, and these are all different manifestations or what we call as the phenotypes that can happen in, in sickle cell disease. These are not just limited to these organ systems. There are other types of complications that can happen as well. Um, so I won't dwell much time in this, but like tells you that there is a huge impact of this disease, not just on one organ system, but it is a multi-organ system disease where um, many issues need to be addressed. 
this becomes very important actually when we talk about transplant and curative therapies as well, because these, these very organ systems are, are crucial for successfully carrying out the curative therapies too. So what are the current interventions that are helpful for sickle cell disease? And we are not talking about cure here right now. So identifying the disease early is very, very important and critical, which I think newborn screen programs are doing a fantastic job with that. Early identification can result can help the families with more with the genetic counseling and as well as the things to look out for and uh, help them integrate with a comprehensive sickle cell program, which eventually takes care of um, of the child as they as they get older and go through the, this this disease. It also helps in educating actually the families. Um, it also can um, um, improve education. Has helped in. Um, in realizing the importance of hydration, avoiding the triggers for sickle cell disease, um, and um, overall helping, uh, helping the families um, learn more about this disease and how to prevent it. Hydroxyurea has been a revolutionary change in the disease where um, it increases the hem fetal hemoglobin, which in turn reduces the percentage of sickle hemoglobin and thus prevents a complication. But there are, there are issues uh, with hydroxyurea as well, as we all know that it is sometimes not, not, not as effective as we would like it to be, even at the max doses, and uh, um, it requires a pill daily. So the, the adherence and compliance with the medication is, is important here. Then there are transfusion programs, uh, simple or partial exchange transfusions, where uh, they can reduce um, the, not the sickle hemoglobin, but the transfusions have their own, own baggage with them. There is the risk of infections with the central line. There is iron overload, which is a big challenge. And uh, um, like over time would lead chelation and, and like after a certain point, even chelation doesn't help much of the iron overload. And there are immunizations and preventive, preventative antibiotics as well to, um, to take care of uh, some of the issues. So now jumping on to curative therapies, and, and this, is, this is a main, um, main issue that we are discussing here is how to fix the bend. So as we know, the, the coding comes from the sickle cell genes, which actually um, code for a sickle hemoglobin and results result in sickle red blood cells. So there, currently there are two options for cure. One is the hematopoietic stem cell transplant where the goal is to permanently replace the defective red blood cells. The other way is actually to fix a genetic mutation in the stem cells. And uh, instead of re replacing the whole system, you can actually uh, focus on the, on the system that is defective. Um, and that is uh, where the means of gene therapy. And I'll discuss both of these options. Uh, first, I will uh, start with where uh, with hematopoietic stem cell transplant and discuss about the bone marrow where all the action is taking place. So what is transplant? We call it hematopoietic stem cell transplant or HSCT, uh, which is also known as blood and marrow transplant or BMT. Uh, and what it does actually is it takes advantage of the fact that problem is in the, in the red cell lineage, uh, which actually comes from the bone marrow. There are three main types of uh, lineages that we'll talk about uh, that stem cells actually um, can give rise to. These are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Actually, this figure sums it all. So where I'm taking you guys now is actually inside the bone marrow. The bone marrow is that mushy part inside every single bone. Like when you break a chicken bone, you like feel that mushy part. That is actually um, a the most important factory in your body where all the blood cells and immune cells are made. It's a fascinating phenomena how this is happening. And um, if you think this as this mushy area where constantly every single second, actually we are seeing this production of cells um, and everything originates from this small set of cells, which is called as, as hematopoietic stem cell. And that is where like the word comes from the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. These are, Hematopoietic stem cells are special cells, actually. They have a unique property, actually, that they can actually make all of your blood cells and immune cells, like all of this down here, and also a portion of them go into what we call as the self-renewal process. And in that, they can make more and more of these stem cells. So if you think of this as a, as a factory and this being the raw material, the way the nature has put this inside us is that you are never going to run out of your raw material, actually 
even like when you are like 80, 90 years old, you are still like this process is constantly happening actually inside your body. So you want like, even if you start with small amount, you can eventually uh, turn it into like a full functioning factory. And that actually is very helpful when we talk about gene therapy option, actually. What ends up happening in this factory is it starts from these, these stem cells as a raw material, and then it goes into two main conveyor belts. Um, this is called a lymphoid lineage, and this is the myeloid lineage. Now, these are the major divisions, actually. And then subsequently, the lymphoid lineage goes into more like more specific conveyor belts and makes most of the immune system over here. Myeloid lineage, in turn, focuses on some of the some of the white blood cells, or which actually help with the immune function too. The main one that we will talk about today is this one over here, which is your red cell lineage. Again, this is another special conveyor belt where this cells goes into trans goes through many transformations. I have for, for simplicity's sake, I have just put one cell and turning into erythrocyte or, or your red blood cell, but it goes through many phases and many transformations. And then the, there are blood platelets actually, which make your, um, which help clot your blood actually. So, so this is what our focus is going to be. And I, I just want um, us to remember while, while talking about transplant is the focus is this lineage, but we do not have a, a sophisticated way of just replacing that portion of, of the factory. The current practice that we have actually needs to replace this whole system using a stem cell transplant. So now going into more details about transplant, uh, the word transplant is fascinating and, and it, it boils down to uh, the original word actually, or the original term where it came from was actually from gardening. So those of, those of you who, uh, who have been avid gardeners, they know that um, you can actually move a plant from one part of a garden to the other one, or actually prepare your soil to, um, to harbor the seeds and actually uh, start a plant in, in, in whatever area of your garden you want to do. And as you know, in gardening, there are three, three steps actually. So first you have to prepare the soil, which is also called tilling. Um, you want to get rid of all the weeds. You want to get rid of all the unwanted things that is there in that area of soil. And once the soil is ready, then you plant the seed actually. And then comes the most important part of nurturing the seeds to make sure that you have a healthy, healthy crop that is growing. Hematopoietic stem cell transplant is similar to this, uh, but again, easier said than done. Um, it is actually, so the, the tilling part here is done by uh, chemotherapy, which um, as we know from, from cancer chemotherapy, from using chemotherapy in, in cancer patients, that one of the main side effects of the chemotherapy is that it kills rapidly dividing cells. Here in this case, it kills the cells in the bone marrow it kills stem cells, it kills all the other cells that are there on the conveyor belt. And we are using that to our advantage here. We are using chemotherapy to do the tilling, to prepare the soil where the seeds will be going in. The seeds is, the seed is the stem cell actually from someone else who does not have sickle cell disease. The whole goal here is to go to this go to this and change this whole milieu here. So we are replacing the hematopoietic, the old hematopoietic stem cells with new cells from someone else who does not have the sickle cell disease. So, so here we are with a stem cell infusion. And then the eventual goal is that after that infusion, there are a lot of changes that happen in the body. There are a lot of complications that one needs, needs, to, needs to be aware of. But the whole goal is eventually this new system will take over the old system and the body will accept this new system. And eventually the patient will live without sickle cell disease. Again, this, is, this cartoon is more for the simplicity. Um, the process is definitely way more complicated than this. But two, two things that I want to highlight here is that this is not a surgical transplant. This is a medical transplant. We use medicines to get rid of the old organ system and replace it with new stem cells. The other thing I want to specifically mention for sickle cell disease is every single transplant, and 
like it, it depends on a lot of variables that we'll discuss in the next, next slide. The underlying disease is very, very important variable because it determines what kind of chemotherapy we will use. It also determines what the length of duration of other therapies and other supportive care we need. And like to reach that ultimate goal is, is so much disease dependent. So talking about these variables, uh, I have highlighted underlying disease in the red because it, like, it is not just a disease, like all sickle cell disease is not the same. All patients are not the same. At what stage, at what status the patient is coming to us becomes extremely important. And these are the variables prior to transplant where we have some control maybe, but the variables after the transplant are, are the ones where we do a lot of supportive care, but we have very minimal control. So I use an analogy that this is, um, this is a roller coaster ride. Before you put your belts on, before you sit in the roller coaster ride, you have some control over things. But once you're in the transplant process, post-transplant course, a lot of it is, um, is difficult to predict. It is um, also doing a lot of supportive care with all the, all the variables that you know upfront, but it is, it is difficult to predict exactly who is going to develop what. So the variables that matter a lot, especially prior to taking someone for transplant is underlying disease status and then donor options. What kind of donors are available? And depending on the donor avail availability, the risk of transplant changes. We'll see in subsequent slides actually um, how grossly they, they change. Uh, and a very important crux of this talk today is to know the donor options sooner than later. The donor options actually um, are, use a, a, a way of immune matching, which we call as HLA. Or, H or human leukocyte antigen, which is actually unique to each individual, um, but there are a limited set of HLAs actually in this world. Uh, so what we, what we do is we take advantage of this and uh, try to match uh, recipient and the donors based on their immune, immune makeup, which actually makes a lot of difference in the post-transplant phase. It is also important to know what age it will be the right age to transplant, and especially it, it, it matters a lot in sickle cell disease, which as we know is a progressive disease and affects multiple organ systems. And a, a two-year-old is at a very different stage as compared to a, to a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old. So, so that factor is, is critical actually, especially when we evaluate someone for transplant. And it actually, it shows up on the, on the outcomes as well um, when, we, when we have done the larger studies on this. And then what we have to take care of and watch out for our potential post-transplant complications, how the immune system recovers. And again, this is, this is very individualistic and this is unique to every single person. And also look into the long-term outcomes and not, not um, have a jury out within six months or a year post-transplant. So some of the co common questions about donors is, they are actually, what is HLA matching? Which is like always uh, uh, something that family asks us. So HLA matching, as I mentioned briefly, is actually an immune match. And it actually um, tells us, the, it is kind of like, it, it is an indicator of our immune system's ability to tell what is, uh, what is ours versus what is foreign. We get this half from dad and half from mom again, like this is the, the similar coding mechanism that we talked about earlier. Uh, and better the match, better are the chances of a successful transplant. Again, it varies from the type of stem cells that you're using or the source of stem cells, but in like as a, as a bottom line, the closer the donor and recipient are matched on their HLA, the better are the outcomes. The other question that often comes up is, what is the likelihood of a sibling being a complete HLA match? And you might have heard us talking about like out of eight match, out of 10 match. Um, and statistically speaking, each sibling has about 25% chance of being a perfect match to the, the patient. Again, the 25% number or the, or the person comes from the chance of half of the same code coming from the mom and half of the same code coming from the dad. So it is like one in four chance. But in reality, because of other complicated mechanism through which a baby is made, uh, it is about 16 to 18% chance. 
The other question that often comes up is, would we use a sibling who has a sickle cell trait? And the answer is yes. The goal here is to reduce the hemoglobin S percentage to a level safely where the main complications of the sickle cell disease do not exhibit. So if you can convert a sickle cell disease to a sickle cell trait, it is still a big win. Another question that comes up is likelihood of finding an HLA match unrelated bone marrow donor. And that's why the uh, Ray's work with Be The Match is so important. And uh, um, I'm glad that Be The Match is uh, doing this whole campaign of uh, trying to get more people enroll on the registry uh, because this, this becomes a big issue. As we know, and uh, to finding a completely HLA match unrelated donor on the NMDP registry is uh, th there's a very high percentage for um, for Caucasians and, and white race, but for blacks and for minorities, the percentage is pretty low. Again, 50% is an optimistic estimate here, to be honest, but we often find it very difficult to find completely HLA matched unrelated donors. Going back to the history of transplant and sickle cell disease, um, it's actually, it's fascinating that transplant was not primarily used for sickle cell disease when uh, people realize that it can, it can work. It was used way back in 1984 in a child with leukemia who um, unfortunately had sickle cell disease as well. And when the child was transplanted, it actually cured his sickle cell disease too. So the proof of concept was there. The theoretical assumption was there and, uh, and it was correct that you can replace a whole red cell lineages too. And then over the years, um, it like, the progress in, in transplant for sickle cell disease was not as we would have anticipated uh, for many reasons, actually. Um, and uh, I would say in last 10, 15 years, the, the switch has flipped and uh, it, it is amazing um, to see the, the, the research and the, the clinical trials coming in this domain. And more, more data is coming in to, to tell us and to guide us what works and what does not work. This table here summarizes actually the outcomes from many different trials um, using, uh, using uh, a lot of different donor options, using a lot of different conditioning, which is kind of like the tilling the soil. Um, and we'll, I'll talk about it about that in subsequent slides. And the overall survival, sickle cell, free of sickle cell disease percentage, uh, and of course, one of the main complications of the transplant graft versus source disease. So, HLA matched sibling, and it is divided into two, um, two conditioning, conditioning types, myeloblative or reduced intensity. Both, have, both of them have shown amazing outcomes. And it is, it is phenomenal that, um, that, that more and more data is, uh, is agreeing that, that this is the best donor choice, and this is something to be considered more upfront for sickle cell patients. The overall survival is like 95% plus, and I would say that with a therapy like this, this is as good as it, get, as it can get. Some of the studies, and, and I was looking at one of the larger studies, which was, which was recently published with more than 500 sickle cell patients. In that study, specifically the patients who underwent a matched sibling transplant at age less than five years, their overall survival was 100%. So all of them survived, all of them like had really amazing outcomes, which is extremely, extremely encouraging and promising. Also, they like the way the survival is measured is that at, it, it is looked at at certain time points. So it could be a one-year survival, it could be a three-year survival, it could be a five-year survival. But another important metric to see how successful the transplant is is to see how how many people are free of sickle cell disease. Because what ends up happening is that you might survive the transplant, but um, there, there is a possibility at a later stage there, there can be an issue with graft failure. And when that happens, usually most of the patients actually, uh, they auto recover their, their previous uh, stem cells. So you go back to the same original, um, or, original bone marrow that you had. And when that happens, you, you again get your sickled hemoglobin and you are again actually having sickle cell disease. Now that there has been a big push to reduce this number and uh, uh, like it is like, so 10% of the patients with mass sibling donor were in that category and uh, 
of late, this, this number has been looked into more carefully because there had been some of the delayed graph failure that, that was not captured in the early data. So a lot of focus has been on that. And because of that very reason, um, the reduced intensity conditioning actually has fallen into less favor as compared to myeloblative conditioning, which is more, more aggressive, more stronger, but has relatively less graph failure in, in the most recent data as compared to reduced intensity conditioning. Also, there are other options. Um, the umbilical cord blood actually um, option that like, especially here at Minnesota, we, we pioneered this, this option, uh, but it has not shown uh, great outcomes as compared to bone marrow uh, when we talk about sickle cell disease. There has been more research going into this, more trials trying to um, tweak things to, to optimize this option. But again, um, it, it has not shown as promising outcomes as a, as a, as a bone marrow as a graph source. And then there, there is HLA matched unrelated donor option where um, some of the, it is not in this table. I'll add that in, into my subsequent slides. It is actually closer to 90 to 95% with a matched unrelated donor. Uh, but again, there's a higher risk of graft failure and, and there's a higher risk of uh, graft versus host disease or some of the post transplant complications. And then there is an option for haploidentical donor, which is actually using a half mesh donor, which um, which is, to be honest, uh, most practical option in, in, uh, in majority of patients. And the reason is um, that usually one of the parents is available, which, is, which, is, which will be half matched to the patient, um, or one of the siblings could be a half, like there's a potential for them to be a half matched too. In those scenarios, the overall survival has improved between 85 to 90%. Uh, the graph failure, this is this used to be very high in those patients earlier on, but this has gone down to 25, uh, 20 to 25% in, in more recent studies and uh, more recent conditioning regimens. But it continues to be an issue. It is something that, that has been closely looked at, uh, but, but this is kind of like the pros and cons of, of different donor options there. This is, a, this is from a recent study that was published in 2019 um, using the CIBMTR data. CIBMTR is the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Registry, which collects information from all the transplant centers in the United States, most of the transplant centers in the Europe, Canada, Australia. So it's kind of like a, um, like a, like a huge repository or huge registry where we can look into these things and these questions um, in, a, in, a, in a large population data set. So this actually study, this study had data, like had transplants from 2005 onwards. And I think 2017 was their stopping point. And it showed again, good outcomes for excellent outcomes from mass sibling donors, match unrelated donor outcomes were lower. And this is um, event-free survival. And so that is taken, that takes into account if you had any of the complications, if you, if you had a graph failure or if you relapse into your sickle cell disease again. So, so, so those outcomes actually are usually lower than the overall survival outcomes. So as you see, MASH unrelated donor had more of like a 69% uh, uh, event-free survival. And the mismatch unrelated donors are um, someone actually closer to, to MASH unrelated donor, but they have some mismatch in their HLA. So their survival was a little bit lower. And then the half match donor had even free survival as uh, 49%. Now this data is actually constantly changing for the reasons that the era in which this study was done or, uh, or took into account uh, is way, way, way different than where, where we are and uh, uh, the kind of transplants that are being done right now. Uh, mismatch unrelated donor has fallen out of favor as compared to haploidentical donor, uh, because this, this curve has shown way more promising outcomes as compared to mismatch unrelated donor. So this, is, this has come much more closer to matched unrelated donor outcomes. So, so it, this has been favored more in sickle cell patients, especially um, the ones who are having a lot of complications and the disease course is, um, is concerning to, to begin with. These are the overall survival op, uh, outcomes. And as you see, even in that era, like we are seeing a 96% match sibling survival outcome over here. Match unrelated donor was 82%, haploidentical was 84%. Uh, 
uh, and mismatch on the donor was 85%. So this kind of like plays around in this zone, uh, but the most important and the most promising outcome is especially for mass sibling donors. Uh, graft failure is always a big issue when we talk about transplant. And if, as you see with different, different donor options, uh, the incidence of graft failure is different. The lowest one is again with a fully matched sibling and then uh, the match unrelated donor option. This data is also changing. I, I know from recent studies, actually, um, this actually is better for haploidentical donor options as compared to match, mismatch unrelated donor option. So the question is then who is eligible for transplant? And it's, it's, a, it's a complicated um, question because it is a lot dependent on the patient and where the patient is. Uh, and, and one of the subsequent slides, I would, I would, I would give my, my thoughts on, on the whole sickle cell transplant paradigm and uh, uh, like how much the indications matter and uh, how much the disease course matters. So the established indications are anyone with an overt stroke or with a TCD velocity more than 200 uh, centimeter per second, um, like they are eligible. If you have frequent vasoclusive crisis and this is taking into account the severe crisis, more than two hospital admissions requiring IV narcotics, they, they, they could be eligible. Uh, recurrent priapism requiring medical therapy, they could definitely be eligible. Acute chest syndrome, even more than one episode of acute chest syndrome can make you eligible. Uh, and red cell al aluminization, osteonecrosis of more than two joints. So as you see, these are the more severe cases which are actually suffering from the sickle cell disease and the disease continues to progress in, in these um, children and adults. So these are pretty much the established indications. The potential indications, and actually most of them have moved to established indications now, um, are a silent infarct with severe anemia or neurocognitive dysfunction. This is very important to recognize that sickle cell disease is a progressive disease. The infarct and the, pro and the neurocognitive dysfunction in these kids are usually progressive. So earlier you stop this progression, the better outcomes will be from the neurocognitive standpoint. So I personally like believe that silent infarct and neurocognitive dysfunction or neurocognitive decline should be, uh, like should be seriously considered into established indication and I do uh, I do favor it, uh, and again, you have to look into, you have to take into account uh, what kind of donor is available and how safely you can take a kid to transplant. But that is that is an important indication. Then cardiac issues with the with the tricuspid regurgita regurgitation jet velocity more than two point five um, is is an important indication. Sickle cell related liver injury or iron overload, and this becomes very important in kids who are on are on chronic transfusion. Um, transplant should be considered sooner than later. Renal insufficiency, kids on dial dialysis, nephrotic syndrome, sickle nephropathy. Again, you want to do, you want to take them to transplant before the renal issues are beyond a certain point. And, I, and in the red, I have highlighted a very important actually uh, indication here is availability of a mad sibling donor. And there has been a lot of um, back and forth on this about the risk of transplant and the benefit with the mass sibling donor. And very recently, actually, American Society of Hematology came up with guidelines that in patients with an indication for transplant, they suggested transplantation with cells from a mass sibling donor early, earlier in life due to risk of irreversible sickle cell disease related damage to the body that increases with age. Uh, on the same guidelines, actually, they also mentioned that it should be considered even in kids who have not shown a lot of symptoms. Um, and uh, it, this is more to be more proactive and prevent the, the worst part of the disease from happening as compared to waiting for some of the disasters like a stroke to, uh, to happen when you have a mass sibling donor available. Um, so as, as we talked about this before, that sickle cell disease essentially affects all the organs. The very important ones that we, uh, that we are very cautious about, uh, especially for taking someone to transplant, is actually heart, lungs, your liver, and your kidneys. And the role that they play is, is becomes, becomes manifold because most of these chemotherapy agents that we are using here are like are metabolized by liver and kidney. They are not your regular medications. These are 
medications that are very toxic and if your organ function organ systems are in the not in the right place or the function is not great then they can actually um, cause more damage than 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 the benefit so so you have to be very cautious and that that comes back to that point that um, how soon you should take someone to transplant uh, so so some of the important points highlighted in this in this slide is um, it's a chronic disease with silent accumulation of end organ damage over time. Um, outcomes of transplant are compromised by this major organ dysfunction. Another important point is to remember that transplant cannot fix the irreversible damage from sickle cell. So the damage that has unfortunately happened, it cannot be reversed. If there's a kid who had a stroke and if there is a part of the brain that got affected by it, Sickle cell disease can stop the further damage, but it will not reverse what has, what has already been damaged. Also as a therapy, as a sickle cell therapy improve, uh, the transplant therapy improves, we, there has been more of a shift to less, less toxic regimens, less severe patients being considered for transplant before the complications arise. This slide actually is a busy slide to give an idea of the, of the transplant timeline actually. Um, so, once we decide to take someone to transplant, there is a whole week of workup where the goal is to evaluate major organ function and also to ensure that there are no infections hidden in the, in the system. It takes about like a week where like the patients go through a lot of scans and a lot of lab work and a lot of evaluations. Uh, once we determine that yes, someone is eligible for transplant um, and move forward with it, the first step is the conditioning regimen, which is a, usually a combination of chemotherapy plus minus radiation. The goal of the conditioning regimen, and, and if I can refer back to the slide where I was showing the tilling process, um, here the goal is to make room in the bone marrow and eliminate immune systems so the donor cells do not get rejected or thrown out of the system. Then comes your transplant day and our whole world revolves around this. We call it the day zero. And th this curve, these two curves in red and blue are to show like what happens to the patient counts, um, like when they are getting the, the conditioning chemotherapy and uh, after they got, got the transplant. So the patient counts like take a little time to dip and the, and the bone marrow to, to be eliminated. For chemotherapy, it takes about seven to 10 days to wipe out the bone marrow. So this is the time when the counts start falling down. And as the donor cells start growing inside the new bone marrow, you'll start seeing the donor cell counts um, come up. Day 14 or, or day 23 is kind of like an estimate around which you, the donor cells have grown into the recipient system to a decent extent where we, call, we, we have specific criteria to call this term, which, we, which is engraftment, that they have established their roots, they are slowly starting to grow, our little, like our um, seeds that we planted on day zero uh, are showing some small pods there. So that is, that is engraftment. And then it takes about four to six weeks, actually starting from the conditioning chemotherapy where the patient is admitted to the hospital to the first discharge from the hospital um, if everything goes well. So, the first month is definitely the most critical period where we watch out for a lot of different complications uh, from fevers to, um, to a lot of organ system issues and specific transplant related complications that can happen in this period. And again, a lot of this depends on what kind of donor you got, what kind of transplant you got, what, what kind of chemotherapy you got. So all of those variables play an important role. After that, there are additional complications that we look out for, and especially in, in children with sickle cell disease, these two are the most common complications that, um, that we, play a very, very, we pay a very, very close attention to. After discharge, um, what, it, what uh, it entails is um, you're not done. <laughs> you have to still have frequent clinic visits. Um, again, some of the complications arise a month or two after the transplant. Uh, which needs to be closely monitored and washed out for. Uh, and uh, often in sickle cell disease, our, th uh, our transfusion threshold is on the higher side um, to avoid some of the neurological complications. 
Um, so these kids require quite, a, quite frequent blood and platelet transfusions. But remember, once we are at a, at a stage where um, the donor cells have engrafted and they start making enough of the donor cells, the transfusion needs slow down. And eventually the goal is that they will not need any further transfusions for their life. What is unique to the transplant for, for sickle cell compared to other, other patients undergoing um, transplant for other reasons, there is an increased risk of CNS complications or the, or the neurological complications. It also stems from the fact that, uh, that a lot of patients who undergo transplant have a history of stroke or their blood vessels actually in the brain are already um, not in the best, best position. And that again brings, um, brings a point to discussion that how soon you should go, go for transplant. Also, there are other sickle cell related complications um, that can happen um, in the post-transplant period, especially the pain crisis. We often see kids go into pain crisis in the post-transplant period, um, but it, over the period of time, it, um, it actually, um, the frequency goes down. We also have specific transplant related things that we, um, that we do for sickle cell patients. This is a study from 2010, actually, which, which talks about the hospitalizations and, and pain and before and after transplant. Again, this is a small set uh, of patients, and this is like an old, old study. This data is way better and uh, way more improved now um, as we are in 2021. So if you see before transplant, this is just like 30 patients, but on an average, there were like four, four uh, hospitalization per patient which actually got, got down to one or, or one or rarely two maybe um, in three years after transplant. So you can see a visible decrease in, in hospitalization as well as the use of IV morphine uh, or narcotics actually post transplant in these patients. What has changed and what is changing in transplant is um, the type of conditioning that we are using, the intensity of chemotherapy regimen that we, were, that we are using um, has gone down. But again, there's a, like a lot of back and forth discussion around this. Um, what the reduced intensity conditioning will do is will, there will be a higher chance of fertility preservation and lesser organ toxicity. Again, infertility is a big issue uh, with any transplant. Whenever we are using stronger chemotherapy, um, the cells in the, in, the, in the gonads actually are very sensitive to the chemotherapy and uh, it can, it, there's a very high risk of infertility in these children. Um, so, so, so there has been more push to try regimens that, um, that improve the chances of fertility in, in this patient population. Also, there have been push to look into alternative donor options where we can use or we can actually um, optimize the regimen where we can successfully use half match transplant and umbilical cord blood transplants. And again, I think I have, I have talked about this about 50 times now on, in this presentation is offering transplant early in life with optimal donor before the irreversible and organ damage happens. Also, there have, this is a very interesting era that we are living in where um, there are different conditioning regimens that have been tried. There is an antibody-based conditioning, um, which will actually um, get rid of a lot of chemotherapy. Uh, which uh, this trial is opening at NIH, I think next year. So it will be interesting to see what, uh, what are the outcomes of, of, of that. I'll also spend like a few minutes quickly to talk about gene therapy. So gene therapy is, um, is again, like a, a fascinating treatment which uses the, the base of transplant. And what it does is that it converts the stem cells, your patient's own stem cells, um, and changes them into a corrected stem cell. And uh, the way it is done is the, there is a way in which we extract the stem cells from the patient, it's called apheresis, where um, we put a line in and we take patient's own blood. It goes through a machine which selectively takes out the, the stem cells and puts back rest of the blood back in the, in the patient. These stem cells are, the, are then taken to the lab. And right now there are two ways in which we are correcting these stem cells of the defect that they have. One way is actually using a virus, which is called a lentivirus, as a, as a transport vehicle to get inside these stem cells and correct the, the gene, the affected gene. And the other way is, um, is a use of CRISPR technology where like you can do the editing 
you can take out the defective portion of the gene and replace it with a, with a normal gene. Once these cells are ready, these cells are then trans, uh, given back to the patient. Now, remember that even with gene therapy, to give, before you give the cells back to the patient, there is some chemotherapy involved because you need to get rid of the old stem cells and the old marrow and the old process happening in the factory. So the, the two main approaches that gene therapy is taking right now is either you increase the hemoglobin F production through the mechanisms that we talked about in the previous slide, uh, which is relatively easier to do, or you increase the hemoglobin A production, which is the normal hemoglobin. Both the approaches are, are targeted towards one goal. You reduce the sickled hemoglobin percent in the body to, an, to a level where it is not enough to cause any complication. And uh, like from the, from the previous data and previous studies that are done in this domain, 30% is the magic mark where, where we are trying to reduce the hemoglobin S percentage too. This is again, a very encouraging era and there are multiple gene therapy trials going on right now. There are about nine or 10 in the domain. Um, the advantages are that you can achieve the cure without the need of finding a donor. Also, there is a different process when, when you're getting stem cells from someone else and the risk of graft versus host disease is, is always huge as compared to gene therapy where, you're, where you, you're using patients' own stem cells. So you're literally getting rid of the, the risk of graft versus host disease and a lot of immune suppression that goes around graft versus host disease. The limitations are, I always say this is still a clinical trial. We don't know what will happen 10 years from now on gene therapy trial. It also requires chemotherapy to get rid of stem cells. So the risk of infertility is still there, uh, can have problems with viral transduction. What it means is that the, the vehicle that we are using to transport the gene inside, um, inside the, the affected stem cells, um, there, there can be issues with that. So far on the gene therapy trials, we have not seen any major issue with that. But the next point, which is insertional mutagenesis, what it means is that we are trying to manipulate the genetic code here. And when we are doing that, there's always a risk that you can inadvertently induce a gene that can cause issues with the stem cells. And when that causes issues with the stem cells, there's a risk that it can actually develop pre-leukemia or leukemia. So, so, so that risk, uh, as we are seeing with the gene therapy right now, is real and there are, uh, there are patients with that risk that have been reported in the gene therapy trials. Here at the University of Minnesota, we have um, Bluebird Bio's phase uh, one, two, it's actually a phase three trial now, um, going, ongoing, um, which actually uses a lentiviral base uh, vector to, in, to correct the stem cells and uh, uses a hemoglobin F base approach where uh, we are trying, trying to increase the hemoglobin F to a percent where we can in turn turn down the sickle cell percentage less than 30. Both the adults and children are eligible to enroll on this study. Um, it's actually, we have, uh, we have one adolescent and one adult who, um, who have uh, consented for, for participation on this study. I will also mention that on this study, um, this study is across like 30 or 35 different centers. It was across US and Europe. The, the company closed down the sites in the Europe uh, but it is still active in, in the US. Uh, there were two cases of leukemia reported on, on patients on long-term follow-up on this trial. So again, the risk is real, but there are other, at least eight other gene therapy clinical trials who are, that are under, undergoing uh, at different centers in the US right now. And there are many, many more in pipeline. So again, it's a very promising era uh, for, for curative options for sickle cell. The barriers, as we talked about while going through the previous slides, are um, the donor options are limited. Um, possibility of having a fully matched sibling donor or unrelated donor um, is, uh, is challenging. And at least for the unrelated donor option, um, actually as more people volunteer to, to be on the donor registry, the more, uh, more are the chances that we'll be able to find an unrelated donor. Also understanding that the transplant process in itself is quite complicated. It is 
not an easy process to go through. It requires a lot of commitment from the families and the patients, and it takes a whole village to transplant. This is not something that I can do by myself. I, it, I cannot tell you like how many people are involved with this process. And it is not just the inpatient and outpatient care. There are a lot of aspects to it that need to be monitored, especially for sickle cell disease. What we have learned is that some of the complications and graft failures, uh, graft failure specifically, can happen late in the disease course. So it even requires a larger commitment, larger degree of immune suppression, and prolonged immune suppression in, in these patients specifically. For gene therapy, the bottom line is that it's a clinical trial. We still do not know the long-term effects of gene therapy. We are in that phase right now where more and more data is coming and. Uh, um, maybe five, 10 years from now, we will have a better idea of what it looks like. But I'll tell you that from the initial results that I have seen on this trial, uh, it is promising. A lot of patients are having a really good HBF and very low HBS level, which um, again, tells you that, that this therapy is efficacious and has promised down in the future. So I think this is my most important slide um, for, for this presentation. So as we know, the risk for organ toxicity, complications, bad outcomes increases with time in sickle cell disease. And there's always a challenge to know what is the optimal time to intervention with transplant or any other curative option. And I, also, I want to highlight that anticipated benefits from transplant or other interventions, they go down over time. So we have to be very, very cautious in knowing where the patient is, understanding what are the anticipated benefits from transplant, before we undergo that, a, a therapy like that, understanding where the patient is, where the family is, all the socio, um, socioeconomic barriers that are there around it before we commit any kid to transplant. Again, as I said, it's a roller coaster ride. And before you jump onto that ride, you need to know what you're dealing with. When to meet the transplant team, uh, I always say sooner the better. I, I actually am a very strong proponent that if, if the family is ready, even after the newborn screen and after initial visits in the comprehensive care sickle cell clinic, if the family is ready, I would like to have that discussion sooner than later. The field is constantly changing and the information is as well. Where what we knew about sickle cell transplants five years ago is very different than what we know now. Knowledge is power, and as Ray stresses upon it, it is important to have this information out there to the families so that each one of each one of the families, each one of the providers can make an informed decision. Intervening at the right time is the key, and I cannot stress upon this more. I, I do feel bad for patients who are referred to us at a later stage as compared to an earlier stage, and there's a lot of things that we cannot do um, when the organ dysfunction has already started. And the most important thing in sickle cell transplant is a community provider partnership. Remember, we are all in this together. It takes a village to transplant. It takes a village to get to that decision to transplant. I, I will never ever push a family for transplant unless I see a very clear benefit and, that, and when that benefit outweighs the risk that we are taking. We need to have these discussions. We need to have these discussions again and again and again because transplant is a complicated process. I cannot give you a zest of transplant in half an hour or an hour. There are questions. There are things that need to be teased out. There are repeated conversations with the transplant team. So, so these discussions are important. The discussions are important between the patient and the families and the hematologist, between the hematologist and the transplant team, between the transplant team and the, and the family. So all that all those, all those discussions and, uh, and decisions are, are very important for ultimately moving forward with transplant. So in summary, the curative therapy options are expanding. I want us to, to understand that there is hope. There is more hope than what there was like 10 years ago in terms of curative options. Outcomes of transplant are imp improving. There are a lot of promises down the road that we are looking into and uh, um, it's, it's a very, very um, interesting era we are living in right now. Gene therapy trials are open to children. And uh, as we talk to more of, more of the companies doing these trials, everybody is super, in, super interested in bringing, the, bringing this more and more to the children. And ask questions, discuss and discuss again. I think that is my role as a, as a, as a stem cell transplanter that I cannot stress upon more that it is 
extremely critical to have discussions and address all the concerns before taking on this roller coaster ride and uh, having this therapy um, for your for your children or for for adults going going through this process. I'm happy to take any questions. And again, discussion is most important thing, I guess. That was incredibly informative. I mean, you walked us through not only the options, but really um, the process. And so thank you, Dr. Gupta. I know that some people are going to need to drop off and I understand that I'm gonna, I just, before we get to, uh, we have two questions. Um, I wanna share with you very quickly um, the how to watch this presentation, the replay of the presentation. We will be uploading it again to our website and our YouTube channel, and you can watch it there. Um, it'll take us about 24 hours. I also want to remind people that there is the Sickle Cell Warrior resource package coming from, that's from Be The Match. It is full of resources. If you're interested in joining the, re the registry, you can go to be the match.org. And then also we talked about um, the importance of donating blood because it does save lives. Now, one of the things that I wanna make sure that I express to everyone is that even if you cannot donate, even if you cannot join the registry, please help us to generate support and, and, and find two or three other people who can. Um, many of these curative, well, I shouldn't say many, but stem cell transplant, that option for many families is based on how many individuals, uh, matching individuals are in the registry. And so if we do not have enough people in the registry, there's less individuals to choose from when looking for that per just perfect match, or the matches become less than what they would be um, desired to be. And so please, you, whether it's your Yourself or whether you are encouraging um, patient families or others in your own community to join the registry. And then of course, donate blood. Yes, yes, yes. We are seeing unprecedented um, need and, and shortages in blood donations. Um, per, yes, for sickle cell disease, but across the board. So frankly, as long as your blood is red, please donate blood. And as far as I know, everybody on this call, your blood is red. So, um, uh, so I thank you for that. So we're going to get back to a couple of the questions that um, was was asked. Um, one of the, the things that you talked about is that there is different rates of success, depending on the transplant type. Do, can you can you speak a little bit more to um, those rates of non engraftment as a function of the transplant type. And thank you, Dr. Jed Gorland from Memorial Blood Centers uh, for asking that question. Absolutely, absolutely. And that has that is a big elephant in the field for transplant for sickle cell disease. And um, I would actually keep aside the match sibling donor option uh, because um, it is an issue there as well. But it is definitely a like a, has been a big issue in unrelated donor options and uh, also in the half match donor options. And what is happening is that like so so sickle cell disease is actually like happening in the bone marrow. The bone marrow is constantly revved up with the disease. Like the body has been pushed, the bone marrow has been pushed to produce more and more red cells. So to tackle the disease in the marrow takes a lot. Also, along with that, when we are talking about um, the unrelated donor options or the half match donor options, we have to change our conditioning regimen. We have to intensify it good enough, but at the same time, the challenge is that if you go too much, then the toxicity increases for the conditioning regimen. So in this era, actually, a lot of the, the half-matched and the unrelated donor options were using what we call as a reduced intensity conditioning. What ended up happening with that was because to reduce the toxicity, we actually um, compromised a little bit on how much like safely you can, um, you can get the graph to be established. Also in sickle cell disease, the goal is not to achieve 100% uh, donor, donor cells there. If Even if you have a lower percentage of donor cells, till you are making enough hemoglobin A to keep the sickle hemoglobin down, that is acceptable. So to reduce the toxicity, we actually started using some of these, uh, these different regimens. And uh, what ended up happening was that we started to see 
that the bone marrow would accept the don donor cells to a certain extent. And then later in the course, which is again fascinating about sickle cell disease, we do not see it as much in other types of transplants for other indications, but in sickle cell disease, it's kind of like the, the recipient's um, bo old bone marrow comes back with a revenge and it throws away the, the donor bone marrow. And that is like six months later, a year later in half mesh transplants. Now we are seeing sometimes two years later, actually, which, which definitely is concerning, but we, were we always used to believe that in the transplant world that once the donor cells are established, like a couple of years is a, is a long time. And in most of the diseases, we don't even look for donor chimerism after two years, more so because we are like, yeah, we are done. Sickle cell disease is different. And it is teaching us more and more how these graft failures can happen. Um, so there has been a lot of push towards that. There has been a lot of tweaking of regimen. There has been a lot of tweaking of immunosuppressive regimen that we use. I'll tell you, for example, even in a mass sibling donor transplant, some of the late, late graft failure happens actually a year post transplant. Again, something that we do not see in other diseases, something that we do not see in other transplants. So now the immune suppression for a transplant for a mass subdonor actually is at least six months. We have actually taken off, like, or at least started withdrawing the immune suppression about two months for, for kids with like having mass sibling donor transplants with, for, for cancers and stuff. But here, the, the, the luxury of taking out the immune suppression sooner is gone. So now there's like more and more push and some actually transplanters I'm totally aware of actually that doing immunosuppression for at least a year post-transplant to avoid that risk of graft failure. But again, that, uh, that's the elephant in the room right now. So I think that that's, you know, the difficult piece and that's part of making that informed decision, right? Yeah. Um, because there's so many unknowns. Um, some of the reason that clinical trials are done um, yeah. is so that some of these um, some of these known challenges can be addressed if there is a way to address them. And so thank you for that robust answer. Um, the other piece that I, I want to add, and, and as a Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota, um, we, we really promote knowledge is power, right? You mentioned it during your presentation, the importance of early referral. Um, one of the things that we learned through hydroxyurea, we no longer wait for the complications before we put um, individuals on, and I can't say we, I, I'm, I'm not in the clinical setting the way that I used to be, but so often as a community, right? And as, as medical providers, um, they're now prescribing hydroxyurea um, prior to all of uh, any, any complications, thus damage being done for so many of the same reasons that you talked about early referral to see a transplant specialist. Um, the other piece is that how a medical professional might uh, uh, deem that a, a patient is eligible, right, is often through a lens of medical complications. I would, I would argue that rarely do we look at the um, social, psychological, um, psychosocial impact yes. of living with sickle cell disease and, and how that impacts health as well. So I challenge all providers um, to, to when considering, you know, when and how or who you uh, refer for a consultation to please look at the entire picture because to be a person or a family living with sickle cell disease is more than if you've had a stroke um, or if, you've, if, if you have you know, concerns um, for organ failure early on. There's so much more to talk about. And so when weighing those options, but also knowledge is power. And so even if they're not, even if a family is not ready at that time, what we're doing is planting seeds. What we're doing is sharing. This is what we know about the, the, the science of transplant now, and maybe even down the road, if that opportunity were still available to them, there's even more advancements, but at least they've already began to have some of that discussion. So there's many different ways to look at um, uh, 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 when and why and who is getting uh, referred to see a transplant specialist. Yep, Anything totally to agree. add? 
Yeah, I totally agree with, agree with that, Ray. And it's, it's such an important discussion. And I'll tell you, even for the families who finally undergo transplant, like that one meeting is not good enough. Like we need to help them understand the whole impact, like commitment for a year at least, like, I mean, with the immunosuppression and stuff, that's a big deal. And and families need to know the whole idea and, and where, where we stand right now in terms of the knowledge for curative options. So that that is extremely important. Excellent. And then the last question is, um, is trans, as transplant is ideal before more sickle cell disease related complications occur, how challenging or what added challenges does that bring to getting insurance approval, right? That's the other piece that we have to address. Yes, I, I completely agree. And so the insurance approval, like um, the finance people go by, like all the insurance companies go by the listed indications. And that's why that statement by American Society of Hematology was very, very important. There is there is definitely a growing body of evidence uh, that earlier you do, the, the lesser are the complications. It is, I, I would say it is much relatively not that difficult for ma like those who have a match sibling donor option. Like the outcomes are pretty, are pretty much out there. And like everybody is very convinced that like even without the even in asymptomatic kids, you can move forward. It becomes more challenging with match on, like when you do not have great donor options. Mm -hmm. Again, like I'm a transplanter, I do transplant day in and day out, but I'll also tell you that it is not an easy therapy. It has a cost to it. It has, it, it, it has a mortality associated with it. So these donor options, these outcomes need to be weighed in. These need to be discussed, need to go, need to go with an open mind and understand that there are definitely risks life-threatening risk associated with transplant and even with gene therapy. So, so all those discussions need to happen. All those information need to be there. And I, I, I would say that um, we are not there where we can do a pre preemptive transplant with alternate donor options, uh, like for sickle cell disease. Uh, and we need to do definitely a, like, a, like a better job with the conditioning and show that th those, those transplants are definitely safer as compared to waiting for a little bit more. But yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum and hopefully down the road we'll have more data about it and better regimens about it. Absolutely, and I do know that within the sickle cell community, there is a lot more um, um, advocacy uh, uh, to insurance companies around the approval processes. And so um, I think that everyone plays a role in advocating um, the way that insurance uh, is, works in this country um, and in, in you know, many other countries that don't even have some of the options that we have, right? And so it is, you know, it is, let's be honest, a complicated mess. Absolutely. However, that's what advocacy is for. That's what organizations like Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota, Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, uh, Sick Cells, all of these other grassroots uh, community-based organizations um, uh, are doing through their advocacy. But I also implore all of you um, who may be in medical spaces um, to to begin to look for ways to partner with community in order to advocate for these things as well. And then if you are a patient or a person living with sickle cell disease or a caregiver, um, we encourage you also to get involved with your local community-based organization and, and, and to help to identify ways that you can help in those advocacy efforts. So one last time, I just want to make sure that I say thank you so much to Dr. Gupta. I want to remind all of you that if you are interested um, in joining the, whoops, if you are interested in ordering or, or providing to your patients um, the sickle cell resource uh, package, you can go to sickle cell connect dot uh, com. If you are interested in joining the Be The Match registry or learning more about it, you can go to be the match.org. And then also the importance of donating blood because it does in fact save lives. We know that we have a community blood bank, which is um, Memorial Blood Centers, as well as National uh, Blood Donor Program through Red Cross. Both of those are wonderful organizations and are available to you. You can view pr uh, previous or future sessions uh, of our Living Sickle Smart by going to our website or our YouTube channel, which is the preferred method. Um, you can also subscribe to our Eventbrite channel as well. We encourage you. Um, and then if you have specific questions that you'd like to ask from Be The Match, um, I'm going to give you an email address. I'll also put it in the chat. Uh, and that is 
Well, actually, I'll give, I'll put it in the chat because I think it's uh, much easier. But it is uh, M Johnsto, M J O H N S T O at N M D P dot org. All right, you can um, reach out to Madison. Johnston, and she will absolutely help to get you connected uh, to the answers to your questions, or she can answer them. Um, but but uh, it's important that we generate this conversation. It's important that we keep this conversation going, and it's important that we empower the community through information. So thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you at our next session. Dr. Gupta, I'll ask you to stay on the line, and we'll yeah. stop recording. See you Ray, next time, everyone. Ray, I will also just add my email address in the chat box. I think yes, Rebecca, Rebecca wanted it to know. So Rebecca, feel free to reach out. Um, again, like we'll be more than happy if there are any questions or patients or if they want to have a consult with us. Perfect. Thank you so much.